happen. And uh, it's sunshine outside today. It's still cold, but it's a little bit sunny. But um, of course, as we unfortunately have to say every day, uh, uh, the situation you know gets worse and worse at the moment. Over 3,000 people died in one day. You now for three days in a row, the numbers were the same. There's like three World Trade Center crashes, one after the other. And, uh, and New York City is still at least also in Midtown, seems to be leaving. The businesses are closed. Uh, and uh, boarded up and uh, but the good news is most probably today that vaccination will be approved uh, in in washington and uh, things will move on but it will not really solve i guess all the big big problems that this uh, moment brought to us richard Schechner said here on the program it's like a nuclear reactor the roof has been blown off and we're looking at a catastrophe but we it's life and we look and see the inside the question is, what do we do with this moment? And the Siegel Talk since March really have tried to hear and listen to artists and their voices. Artists who have been on the right side of history, the complex struggle for freedom and artistic expression, these fundamental right, access to healthcare, access to education, but also access to art and access to the political process. But the arts are very, very important. They are significant over thousands of years. They have been part of what it is and what it means to experience life. And the great Joseph Boyce, the artist, who also knew, he would say, you know, we are born into forms, or forms are there, and it's our job to change what's not working and to preserve what is working. But we have to be an active participant and create, like artists, the world um, we live in. Um, since a little break in, in August, we started to talk again to theater artists, but we also open it up in this kind of enlarged idea of the field of theater and performance, the curators, producers, uh, um, academics, researchers, uh, people, dramaturgs, like yesterday, um, the LMDA representatives were here. And one of those great, uh, great, uh, how would one say, rocks of the landscapes of the New York theater, especially the downtown, but I would say of all of New York City is with us here today, um, the Vallejo Gantner, who we uh, look up to and we know him for many years, so Vallejo, Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for joining us. I think he is one of the leading curators uh, globally um, in the world, a thinker, a forward thinker, um, often here on the road, always looking what is ahead um, of the curve with a great concern and also love um, for the field. And he has had a real impact. I'm going to read a little bit from his bio. He is uh, actually now, since 2019, the artistic executive director of the Onassis Foundation USA, a foundation that has done a tremendous amount of work for the arts globally, but also and especially here in the US and in New York. And <clears throat> it is an uh, innovative program, the Onassis Foundation, based in Athens with satellites in New York City and Los Angeles. Before, he was the artistic director of PS122, the great performance space, PS122, which he helped to re vitalized to reinvent what it was all about and way it was a home for new york artists but things change the neighborhood changed and he said we also need to listen to global voices and he invited uh, so so many great great artists early on in their career but also significant established ones we perhaps didn't uh, know about um, it's now uh, called Performance Space New York, of course. Um, he has been a consultant to BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and the great Theater Develop, maybe one of the best festivals on theater and performance worldwide. And for over 20 years, he's been working across live performance in all disciplines that includes cinema design and hospitality. And he has always sought innovative artists, work and ideas, building new experiences and new forms of communication for audiences. And this is what this is about. We say, like Brecht said, new times need new forms of theater. And this is uh, uh, what we will be talking about. He also is involved in film distribution models. Uh, Hoovi, you all should look that up, H-O-O-V-I-E, um, to have uh, film screenings in private spaces and marks, which is uh, supporting urban ecosystems of artists, artisans and ideas of people, M A. KRS is a member of the family Meyer Family Investments and uh, Joango uh, in Melbourne, and um, and he is finding new sustainable structures at the moment. He's on the board of Between Time in Bristol, the great chocolate factory here in New York City, 
and um, as we don't know all of it, but many, many various uh, uh, institutions uh, in Australia. He comes from a great theater family uh, and <laughs> is uh, one of the great things also when families are able, whether they're doctors or artists or a producer, you know, that somehow they build on decades of work that has been there before. So um, Vallejo, um, we always say it's about radical listening and then I go on and on rambling in the beginning. I hope you will forgive me, but really we want to now know what's on your mind, what you think about. So where are you? Are you in Melbourne, in Bristol, in Edinburgh? Where are you now? I'm in New York City, Frank, just like you. Um, uh, uh, came down this morning. I, I've been very blessed and fortunate to be able to spend a lot of the last seven months uh, uh, out in the countryside, uh, uh, but have been in and out of the city and trying to take the pulse and be connected to the pulse of the city uh, during, throughout the, the pandemic. Um, but yeah, today in the beautiful city, as you said, it's a blue sky, and then, but winter is coming <laughs> to be coming. terribly yeah. cliched. <laughs> yeah. And listen, Vallejo, we know you also as someone who's always in New York, but also flying around the world. And uh, he would say, let's meet tomorrow for a coffee. Oh, no, I'm in uh, actually in Melbourne uh, or whatever. So now <laughs> the world has radically changed as it has changed for yeah. all theatre artists. Um, there are no jobs. Spaces are closed. Most probably till next fall, nothing will happen. We hear early reports that universities will go to online teaching also for next semester in the fall. Uh, devastating news. Uh, also not good for theaters uh, news, you know. So what do you make of the situation we are in right now? I mean, globally, it's, I, of course, it's very simplistically, it's a catastrophe. And uh, it's something that, that I, you know, in, in a way was clear in March, <laughs> you know. Um, that this was happening and it's been a fundamental change to all of our lives uh, and profound change to all of our lives. Uh, but, I mean, what do we make of it? We should, I, I feel like what we need to be making of it is what are we going to do with this? The, the, the thing I keep thinking about is or the, the thing that makes me uh, almost more afraid than the perhaps direct consequences of what is happening uh, uh, around the world, but particularly in the US uh, as a consequence of the pandemic is, is the thing I'm afraid of is, is that we waste this crisis and we must not, cannot waste this crisis uh, and, and fail to use this moment and, and, and whatever we have, whatever abundance that we do have, to come out stronger and better and uh, in a better place uh, when, uh, when it, it stops. Um, I'm trying to avoid using the term when things get back to normal. Normal wasn't that great for so many people and so many artists uh, and so many parts of the society that we're in. So- What was wrong? Uh, what was wrong? Oh. <laughs> Where do we begin? Uh, whether, it, I mean, I think there were power imbalances between uh, artists and institutions, the funding relationships and the way we imagine the kind of network or web of relationships that we have within the field. Uh, we're all skew if things were out of order. Um, obviously, there were issues around uh, representation, but not just representation, but, you know, uh, uh, the, the way we were dealing with uh, different communities, uh, the, the who was uh, in power in site institutions and whose stories were being told and, and who they were being told to. So who, who, who was in the audiences, but, uh, and, and those at a certain point, the challenge of, of many of those things, of course, is that they are a reflection of the society that we're in. Um, and at a certain point, uh, as we've, as I've been in so many conversations, as we all have about, you know, where do we want change to go and how do we want it to work? The part of the thing is you end up, you keep ending up on this brick wall of, well, that's how the society that we're in works, you know, uh, and can we now imagine changing everything? Um, uh, but so 
I don't even know where to begin to answer that question, Frank. It's a, <laughs> but, uh, and we can't fix everything. Uh, but uh, I think we need to try and imagine a future and a changed environment where things are more equal, where uh, the kind of centers of power of, or the power itself is, is more distributed, um, where there is a much more kind of open conversation uh, uh, between uh, around uh, what is needed and and what is wanted, um, uh, and 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 figuring out different levers and different uh, mechanisms that we use to make work, uh, to make work more vital, uh, to make it more abundant, and to uh, perhaps uh, make it make it step forward with a greater level of confidence. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's uh, it's a bit vague, but uh, no, no, that's, that's I mean, important to tell me more. Uh, well, I think you know, I think as uh, the the situation in the U.S. Uh, and and as and it's we talk, we we tend to talk too much in in the, in the states. I think we always sort of talk about how hard it is here. And it's not that it's easy everywhere or everywhere else. And we were always looking at Western Europe and thinking, wouldn't it be lovely to be in the land of subsidy? And it's not, it's no picnic over there either. Um, it's a different set of challenges and a different set of situations. There is a kind of resilience in, in the US that is incredible, but there is also a constant uh, consciousness of precarity and of uh, the sort of, and I think a, a, a sense of impotence that drives that that can be that can become immobilizing. And I think the challenge for us now is to find ways of breaking that trap of precarity, of uh, finding ways to realign the resources that we can control um, to better serve the the artwork or the performance or the theater or whatever it is that's being uh, created and put in front of people to find ways of bringing different kinds of people to that work and to figure out how to actually articulate uh, and extend or amplify the impact of that work. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess uh, um, also uh, we, we are used to normally we said we criticize the world and if we were in the zoo, everything would be fine. But in a way, with the Black Lives Matter moment, the white the white theater, with the corona for us being declared non-essential, we understand maybe we also will have to change, right? We have to do things differently. What what do you say? People like people you talk to also, curators, producers, uh, festival artistic directors um is is there a sense that, that something is changing and that will be changed i mean i think many of the conversations that have taken on uh such huge kind of visibility and um uh uh presence now post uh well since george floyd uh was killed um, you know, they, they were already happening to some level. Uh, uh, there was, I think, a lot of organizations and a lot of uh, lip service being paid and they've taken on a much greater depth and urgency now. I think it's far too early to tell whether uh, things change in a, in a fundamental way. But I think um, I, I'm optimistic that we will end up with organizations that uh, look and sound and behave in ways that are far more uh, conscious of the society and the community in which they exist and, and from which they draw their strength. Um, and there'll be a much more kind of uh, perhaps egalitarian kind of dialogue that happens. Yeah. Um, and Vallejo, you are uh, one of the people who make things happen, one of the people I know, one of the people who listen and think and also put something in a form. Um, I know at the, uh, your time at the Onassis Foundation there, you know, uh, now uh, there are things you created um, which we might not all be aware uh, about, about the higher artists, the studio or, or commissions. What did, from your experience, and I think you 
for over 20 years. Is that right to say you have worked in the field? Yeah, well, I've been uh, in the field for uh, 20, what year is it? 2020, so 22, 23 years. Almost a quarter um, of a century. You were put yeah. in charge of yeah, the yeah. institution, say, invent something. They gave you some toys, some money to play with. And you said, I think this is important. This is the time of Corona. So tell us, what did you come up? Tell us about those initiatives, what you put into place. So, I mean, well, there are a number of different things. It's it's interesting. So the, 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 the extraordinary thing about the Anasa Foundation and the brief that um, we had there was that it didn't, it wasn't a fixed entity. It wasn't a venue or two spaces. We didn't have to sell this many tickets a year or a season to do anything. Um, uh, it was a place where, which actively sought the integration of kind of humanities, ideas and artistic activity. And, and as such kind of was incredibly freeing. Um, and I think the, 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 and we didn't have a fixed program that we were about to roll out this uh, this spring, uh, and and so we were able to to imagine what we were going to do. And 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 one of my colleagues, Sophia Eftimiatu, uh, came up with this wonderful idea for the Enter program, uh, which was a program that we rolled out throughout the spring and into the summer of sort of a rapid response commissioning program uh, where artists were given. And, they, and there were artists from Japan, from uh, uh, the UK, from, uh, of course, many from Greece and from the US. Uh, and they were given about two weeks to create something uh, that needed to be made in conditions of quarantine or lockdown uh, for audiences who were in the same state. And um, so many of them would, were video based, uh, but some like Risa Puno, she created a, an entirely new Dungeons and Dragons game that was based on kind of uh, a subterranean fear of what was going on with COVID. Uh, others like Kimberly Bartosik created a game that was a, a visceral kind of reflection of the, the collective insanity that her family was feeling being stuck in their Brooklyn apartment for so long. The, the, the breadth of work, um, was remarkable, and and we were fortunate to work with the Queen's Museum and uh, new uh, the new New Ink and uh, with the Chocolate Factory to curate three other programs with them. And for us, what what that became at a certain point as well was was us as I guess trying to understand that there's a responsibility as someone who does have some of the levers. Mm. and some ability to make things happen as as we all do in different ways but you know uh, perhaps i did more than others uh was the, we we have a responsibility to 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 create and to evolve and to lead the way that we will respond as kind of institutions and and create possibilities for artists to make uh, uh, new forms, as as yeah. you referenced yeah. earlier, and to create new opportunities, not just for the artists to create, but for audiences to experience. Because, yeah. of course, we we do tend, or we talk a great deal about the challenges that artists face in this particular moment, and the economic impact of what's going on, and the racial disparities that are present, and the the discrimination that's present. But we. Uh, in that context, but we also need to kind of con constantly, I think, make sure that we're we're feeding an audience, that we're bringing people in to find artistic experiences. Because uh, if people forget that that sense of discovery and that sense of engagement with creative activity, it's much harder to, br to bring them back later. And I think uh, those of us who are uh, who ha who have this sort of and also those of us who have security in our jobs, those of us who have an income and who have programming resources, it, it's absolutely, we're beholden to use those and to bring those to bear to continually try and bring things forward. Yeah, just to make uh, and clear, uh, for the audience, if I understand right, you said to artists, 120 hours work, do something in your home, in your living room, in your kitchen, 
we give you a, wherever do what you want we support you but also share that moment and uh, everybody so, so many theaters say well our theaters are closed so we can't do anything but they should yeah. have a budgeted for the year there must be some money we are not talking about millions and millions of dollars. it's just uh, ongoing support so this is a model you know that is of course different you, you don't have to come to that theater and go and buy the ticket sit in that seat you say no we do it in your home and you can consume it you can look at it in your home so it's something radically different and it's something that yeah. can be done absolutely i mean i i was uh thinking about uh the balcon is it uh the the project that Joanna Warsaw and and, uh, and yeah. someone else I'm forgetting their name in Berlin curated, which was a program of artists who are making work on their balconies in Berlin. Please, yeah. And I keep wandering around the East Village, thinking, why the hell aren't we doing that on the fire escapes in the East Village? Why aren't we using the windows of these buildings around us to make new dance works or new theatre works that might be heard remotely? Why aren't we doing that? You know, why aren't we bringing it? Uh, as Susan Feldman said uh, in an earlier talk uh, with you, you know, that that the inversion of that relationship where you normally are trying to bring people into your space, let us bring it out to other peoples uh, in ways that are safe and socially distant and so on. But but to do that, and and I think that's our responsibility, it's yeah. is to figure out how to how to pivot our organizations and and it's it's really challenging because you know I, one of the things that's been frustrating is I don't see that our organizations here in in New York and and uh, and in the US we're not nimble we're not agile uh, as businesses even you know and perhaps we need to think more about the kind of startup business model of being very nimble being agile being able to pivot uh, and 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 in doing so sustain our kind of mission of bringing ideas and bringing artwork uh, to an audience uh, without having to sell them tickets, without having to um, uh, 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 bring them through a lobby or a space where they don't necessarily feel at home. And this, this pandemic and this crisis uh, is perhaps a, a, an extraordinary opportunity uh, to do that and to find new ways of talking to people. Uh, you know, thinking uh, about something again, Rabbi uh, Mulhue said uh, recently uh, in his talk uh, on this platform that, that he was talking about the fact that, uh, you know, watching theater on Zoom is an incredible emancipation for an audience. And I kind of, I was driving as I heard that and, and you know, it felt like the top of my head had lifted off because we've been talking about how, how limited it is and how stuck we feel looking at this two-dimensional screen all the time and thinking, okay, no, let's actually say, okay, this is one of the tools. This is one of the ways of doing it, but it's not the only way. It can be interactive. It can be different. It can be challenging. Um, but there are, there are so many other sites, so many other spaces within which we can create and with we, within which we can uh, both you know support audiences but support artists to make that work and uh, and and try and engender and trigger people to do that yeah yeah this is that is quite I think that's quite significant what you say and uh, that we perhaps will not be able to think very simple very very simple things like, why would it take a pandemic to say let's have a rock concert on the roof why would it take a pandemic to say let's do something on balconies for the people why even yeah why was that part of why was it even on-site or off-site work as bertie fortman says why was it in the big sushi meal we have the little cut ginger on the side you know all the time <laughs> mean, but people, love it. people like it and it reaches so many different people and why aren't Absolutely. we um, doing it and I think um, this moment, you know, if it does anything and, and uh, perhaps it, it, it will help us to, to really radically rethink as we want artists, we ask all the artists, do radical work, rethink, question the institution, you know. Uh, but we, but, but what but are we doing? As, in, as, as institutions, we have to do that same question. Yeah, we don't. Know, we, have to, we have to turn ourselves into something 
where we are porous or 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 flexible or nimble enough to actually reimagine the economics of how we're doing things, where we are um, also open to the idea of changing ourselves, you know, not being fixed about this is how we manifest, this is what we look like, this is how the public perceives us. Uh, certainly, I think there's ways of staying true to your mission and, and to your core, but, uh, but to do it in ways where, you know, when you transport work into different environments, the quality and the nature of it changes. And being open and, and, and kind of excited about the possibilities of that, just as doing work from one part of the world in this part of the world or vice versa, often transforms the way it's seen. It's no different. It can happen within one city um, or within a block of a city. Um, and, and I think, you know, being open to that and, and, and able to, to take advantage of this moment uh, is something that I think, you know, the organisations that and the institutions and the, and the structures um, that uh, survive and thrive after this pandemic will be those who were able to, to, to not waste the crisis. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, and of course, as Hans T. Lehmann said, who wrote the great post-traumatic theater book, you know, theater performance is a big house and it has many rooms. Nobody says this is now all, all what, all what we do, but I think yeah, yeah, yeah. it forces us to rethink and I say maybe, and it goes back to the very, very, very beginning, whatever the first maybe funerals of mankind, when they throw something into a grave and they, and they had a concept of, you know, an afterlife and some shaman did a dance. It was, the very, it was outside, it was natural light. People got together mm -hmm. in a circle, they were singing, they were speaking, you know, and it was not in the highly specialized expert spaces where you train for decades on, expensive schools and then you're allowed to, to do something and of course we love all that too and it is great no but and of course but we've been, is, and we've seen some, yeah well we've seen so much work like that recently that started down that path of of working with non-performers or untrained performers or, or really documenting things whether it's the work of kind of a rimini protocol or others who have been sort of focused on excavating that kind of reality um, in different ways. Um, uh, and I think this is an opportunity now to sort of extend that even further, um, uh, perhaps in, in art forms where, where the audience is given even agency to generate the story. And perhaps this is one of the things that this digital moment will also give us is, is, is new ways of giving audiences the power or the agency to, to navigate um and uh, and to steer that ship i mean it's a it's a it's we, a question we had, uh, um, paper moon company the great paper moon company from indonesia mm -hmm. and they said what they did is they said well send us ideas for stories give us a bit of money however you want to as a gift we'll create something for you and make a zoom from or they said yeah, yeah, yeah. with material to build puppets and then told them you know uh, to do something in their homes they said you have a loved one someone who works in a hospital um, we'll make a performance for them, just for them, you know. Yeah, sure, and, sure, 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 sure. You, you tell us, uh, what we, I mean, it's a side thing, but, oh, but things are happening. Valeo, you, you are someone who really has his ear on the global landscape in New York, in the US, but also globally. You talk to so many, you have, you have such a vast network, you're such a great communicator. And uh, what are you detecting globally? But what are your talks? What, what, you, what are you guys talking about at the moment? I mean, the question I've been trying to ask people is where is it working? What's working? You know, who's doing it well? And, and I was talking to a colleague in Athens this morning, uh, Ash Bulayev, and, and I put that question. He said, well, the, you know, uh, uh, the Belgians have got a whole lot of things figured out that we're not. Uh, that we're not doing. And I was like, oh, what is it about that? And, and you know, one of his points was that it was the the organizations and 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 to some extent the artists there had a, a greater sense of security and confidence about where they stood and about their future and and they weren't possibly struggling in the same way and one of the challenges about uh the situation as it's unfolding here but of course also across the world 
for artists who, whose entire livelihood has gone is that now everybody is engaged in sort of day hand-to-hand -hand combat of survival <laughs> um, rather than in and and there and so somehow I think what he was articulating was that the the there was a need to make that space uh, where we can imagine different ways of working different art forms, different ways of surviving, different ways of thinking about how we relate to audiences or the kinds of spaces that we're going to make work in or how the economics of it might work. And uh, it's difficult at the moment to, to, to imagine being able to do that, but I think it's the most important thing we can do during this period. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think that we need to start doing in, in organisations in the city is actually bringing artists into the institutions to help us be better at how we work, whether that's bringing them in as curators, bringing them in on funding panels, bringing them in uh, to, to advise us as, as, as we run our organizations, to, to, to give them a, a sense of, to give, or to, to make sure that, that the sense of agency is not just held by the gatekeepers, by the people who are running the organizations, by the funders, but actually by the people who are at the coalface of making the work. Uh, yeah, uh, I think it's, I think, um, but, and, and I think it is happening. I think there's, there's really, uh, there's beautiful examples of people trying to figure out how to, how to also think about what does it mean to be very local and very global, you know, and, and there are so many challenges to the global piece right now. Uh, obviously the fact that we can't travel. Uh, but I think in the bigger picture, as, as uh, many artists and, and institutions have really started interrogating the uh, sustainability of the mobility that we have enjoyed, and, and I particularly have enjoyed over the last 20 years, it's, it's probably not viable in the same way. We cannot, uh, the climate crisis does not allow us to continue to behave that way. And perhaps How was that already... for you? How was that for you to be at home in your apartment basically since March. I know you're upstate at beautiful space, but still, how do you experience this as a... I mean, it, it's, it's, it comes in waves. <laughs> um, uh, there's been something magical, particularly uh, about being sort of stationary and being so much more conscious of the duration of a season. You know, for the first time, uh, 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 my place upstate I, I watched a tree kind of bud leaf out uh, be green go violently red and then and then one day I woke up and the leaves dropped uh, and I'd never been there for that whole thing before uh, you know I, when I think I, you know I'd been jumping north northern hemisphere to southern hemisphere for two decades and had never been in one place. It's the longest I've been in one place for 20 years. And uh, it's been, there's been something really magical about it. Um, I wish sometimes I'd had more time to sit still and, 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 and to contemplate it and to think about it, to read. Uh, but it's been, uh, to be honest, <laughs> it's funny. Uh, the pandemic began and uh, uh, I feel like I just got busier um which was slightly frustrating uh but uh but i mean obviously uh, that frustration comes from uh the great privilege of having uh had a job and uh had things to do uh and projects to deal with and and so on which so many people didn't mm. um but it's been very strange it's been very strange and very very it's been really inspiring when you find something and you start talking to people and and you know there is a new group uh sepa of independent producers that is forming around trying to figure out new models for how to support that critical piece of the infrastructure in the us um there are there's a, a group of artists that are trying to argue for uh greater levels of um uh, economic equity between the way they are presented, particularly in the area of dance and the institutions. There's uh, a, a web platform being built for indigenous artists to kind of share and communicate if their work across the US or North America rather and uh, Australasia. 
uh, and and kind of finding parallels in that kind of work. So there are incredible things happening, and and it's so exciting uh, to sort of, in some cases, stumble across them. Um, uh, every time I, as I was saying, I said earlier, that every time I kind of click on a How Rounds website, I, I I kind of feel like I'm falling down a rabbit hole. Um, but uh, but uh, you know, at, at the same time, it's been infuriating, um, and and. Uh, uh, sometimes difficult to imagine kind of finding uh the the sort of energy and get up and go again to go and do do work but but that's what we've got to do <laughs> we've got to find these new platforms and we've got to commission new work and we've got to make things happen um yeah. and 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 we've got you know the the great uh power of the of the artists that we work with is their ability to kind of see new pathways through all of this and you know i'm really proud and excited of, of the work that we've done uh with onassis uh not just with the enter program but uh the kind of uh the exchanges that i see happening in athens and the work that's been done in athens about finding new ways of, of sending the work that uh, our center there, Steggy, did uh, and has done, uh, we've opened uh, we've opened a new XR or cro uh, uh, mixed reality production studio and exhibition space in the basement of the building that we're in in Midtown, in Manhattan, where 23 artists are creating not only new XR works but. Um, but uh, also building a community amongst themselves that will share ideas and share knowledge and share skills uh, and that will begin to show that work. Um, we also just uh, rolled out, or we haven't publicly announced it yet, but uh, uh, we are, we, we've so this commissioned is a 15, announcement. Yeah. yeah, this is the premiere announcement. We've commissioned 15 different uh, artists, kind of as an extension of the ENTER project, but we gathered a group of curators and uh, a jury, if you will, and, and uh, we reached out to, uh, to try and find uh, work from artists that we knew and artists that we didn't um, uh, across all disciplines. And the kind of primary curatorial criteria was to try and find work and ideas that were, I guess, native to this situation and this context and and uh, in that i mean both the kind of context of the pandemic um and and whether it's social distancing or finding different platforms uh, by which ideas can transmit but also the moment of social justice and the moment that we're in culturally and socially and politically in the us um, and, you know, there are some thrilling, uh, very exciting projects at all, all the different stages of development uh, that are going to come out of that over the next year or so that will happen uh, with us uh, at MoMA, at the Chocolate Factory here in New York and on the boards in Seattle, uh, in San Francisco or Oakland um, and it, uh, in, it, in the Midwest. Something they artists develop some of it, Some of it will be at home. Um, Kristen Cosmos uh, and hopefully a couple more artists are uh, making work that will be sent through the post uh, uh, in a kind of uh, a, a domino chain of gifting. Um, uh, Nature Theatre of Oklahoma uh, are doing a kind of riff on Easy Rider uh, called Uneasy Rider where they will ride a motorbike across the country. Uh, Builders Association is doing an incredible piece about the micro workers uh, who uh, work with uh, Amazon and others, uh, sort of the, the current kind of um, peace workers, uh, not peace, uh, P-E-A-C-E, P-I-E-C-E, -E, for micro workers. Um, Kaneza Shahl is uh, uh, using the Mark Twain, uh, uh, King Leopold, uh, uh, novella or uh, book uh, to uh, create a work about that that'll happen in different locations uh, around the country and uh, around New York in the public spaces that were built as theatres in different parts of New York City 
um, that um, uh, now have become unused or underused in, inside the housing project. So, you know, a, an array of work that- uh, It's incredible. That this is a, like a research lab in the basement of your foundation where normally people uh, store old uh, uh, printed books, you know, about past programs from 20 years ago. You create a, a research lab, a 3D lab, and now you're putting that out. What almost sounds like uh, something, what a what a BAM or a whatever, like a Lincoln Center or yeah, yeah. A public theater. Oh, no, it's uh, it's yeah. exciting because it, it it was the you know the the thing that we wanted to move beyond. The thing you know, Enter was really about a digital transmission. Uh, and in this, we wanted to move beyond a screen-based kind of concept uh, and, mm -hmm. and really think about different ways. Digital is still part of so much of it. Stephanie Dinkins is doing an extraordinary new work. Uh, Annie Dawson is using her algorithmic theatre to, uh, I guess, finish the, um, the, the, the Prometheus. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and um, the, so, the, you know, it, it, it's, it's here. It's, it's not like we can run away from uh, the digital transformation of our lives, but the way we think about it doesn't have to be about a passive experience of sitting in front of a screen uh, and how it infects and, and, and how we work with it. Um, yeah, it's exciting. It's, 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 a been, remarkable it's been a really, yeah. it's been a really exciting time uh, in that sense where you know, it, the pandemic did create space for us to be able to sort of reach out and push, you know, try different things and to experiment and to take those risks. Um, and uh, so that's been, that's been uh, very, it's been fascinating and yeah. Uh, and and it, <laughs> I guess it keeps us busy in the, in these days, which is also important. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a lot of work. As some comedians said, art is beautiful, but it's a lot of work. So really amazing. It's, I can only it's, imagine it's, the talks and mail that behind such a gigantic project coming out of one organization. I mean, I always loved the quote from a German poet, I think it was 18th century, Friedrich Holderlin, who said, if there is danger, that what will save us also grows. You don't see it right away, but it's also growing like your, your, your tree you talked about, you know, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. something that we have to be reminded of. There's something happening, you know, it also reminded me till, till the 19th, till the 20th century, almost 90% of world population was in agriculture. Now this gigantic change has happened and, um, and how do we react to it and what have we lost and what do we have gained? This moment is reminding us perhaps also we are. Um, part of that critical zone, as Latour says, the 10, 15 meters of 30 feet above the earth and below the earth. This is what mm -hmm. makes life. Mm -hmm. We only mm -hmm. live because we live. We only there are plants only live yeah, because yeah. we are plants. We are no longer in the center of it. And I think of the universe. We have understand that there's something like invisible, like a virus you cannot even see under a microscope will kill us and could be theoretically the end of mankind. And so uh, I think inventing things um, like you do is uh, that is significant. I also like if I understand right, you have the nature theater of Oklahoma of this world and the great artists, but you also created something like an Etsy for artists where people can offer. Uh, their... I, I didn't know about it. Uh, uh, tell, tell us a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I are, uh, so I are... It was funny. Uh, it's one of at the beginning of the pandemic and, and you know it was very clear in March that this was going to be a catastrophe for the living the ability of artists to live and was trying to think about how I could help and without it just being sort of lending people money or whatever you know without it and, and but it, so making it something that is work that is productive and I thought oh great I'll get uh, a dear friend uh, choreographer Petra Zanke who's also an amazing French teacher. And I thought, great, I'll finally learn to speak French. And so I've been learning French uh, for the last six months, seven months. And, and that triggered a whole kind of, again, a domino chain of thinking, well, every artist that we know has a, other skills, other hustles, other, all their skills can transmit in other ways, not necessarily in the context of being on a stage with an audience over there, but actually whether it's choreography or, or other things like uh, Lucien Zion at The Invisible Dog is an extraordinary chef who's been running cooking classes. Sybil Kempson is an expert forager. Uh, 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 
There are artists who uh, are making custom crossword puzzles, others who are building playlists, and others who uh, are uh, film editors or uh, script editors or vocal coaches or uh, portrait painters. Um, so we created a marketplace called hireartists.org which was a, a way for people just to create an alternative revenue stream for themselves, another way of trying to sustain themselves that was work. And um, said, okay, we're not gonna take any fees. Uh, it's, it's really a, a relationship between a, a buyer, a supporter or whatever, and someone who has a skill that they can lend, that they can offer. And, um, uh, and it is, it's language classes, it's ed editing video, it's accountancy, it's foraging classes. It's, there's a whole sort of panoply, a collage of, of amazing skills that people are offering, uh, writing songs for you, creating playlists for you, DJing, singing live at your event via Zoom, um, all sorts of things. And, um, and and it's you know it's ticked over quite a bit of of it, it, the way we thought about it initially was that we didn't you know there's that thing in New York where you, we're all going to each other's fundraisers. I always used to say that the same twenty dollars is being just kind of recirculating around the system. Mm -hmm. And the idea here was that it wasn't that it wasn't artists trying to kind of pay other artists to teach them how to do something, but rather for those of us who. Uh, who are sustained, who continue in our jobs, who continue with our income, um, are able to support people to do something. And, and, and something that you want artists, or you need. How many artists are on this? I mean, hundreds and hundreds. Yeah, it's uh, like yeah, a, see, it was incredible. I was not. Yeah, a, yeah, no, it's a, it's quite interesting. It's, it's amazing. Brilliant teachers, artists are great teachers. So I encourage them. It's yeah, yeah. higher artists. And, and higher artists and they're from all over the world um so it's and and the you know uh my mother's learning language is now in australia with the with petra here in new york and and you know so there's there's like buyers and 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 sellers from all over the world and and again the condition of it is that these uh services or these products or whatever it is have to be um uh given in a way that's safe and secure it's amazing but now if i may ask how did you get to curating and to be an artist today? What, what, how was your journey? How did, what, what makes you run? Well, as you said, I mean, I grew up in theaters. Uh, I, 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 my mother was an actress. My dad was an actor. He ran a theater company and my mum was a, became a director. She's still directing shows uh, like crazy. My, I think my mother's been busier in lockdown than anybody I know. She's opening the Victorian opera season this Christmas with a production of Sleeping Beauty. Um, so I grew up kind of backstage and, and you know, sitting underneath the box office, uh, getting fed candy from box office people as I was hanging out waiting for my parents to come out of rehearsal or out of a show. So I grew up in it and then uh, went away from it for a while, but kind of wanted to be an actor, realized I was terrible. I was a terrible actor. And, um, and then, it, but what I was able to do was produce and kind of bring things together and try and synthesize different elements of what was going on. Started doing that at university. What was, your first, what then, was the first thing you put together? I became the producer of our university production of A Midsummer Night's Dream which was this kind of very, felt very radical at the time kind of version that had an amazing cast and team associated with it uh, of incredible people. Uh, writer Mitchell, Diana Glenn, uh, Adam Bronowski and uh, Jeff, so many, so many amazing people, amazing acrobats, performers and incredible design. And it ended up touring to Singapore and playing sort of three different seasons in Melbourne. And, um, and that's where I got the bug of being able to go, okay, let's put these things together. Um, and, and when you're, uh, I, and I think maybe I'm too much of a control freak to, to, to want to give that up. Um, so, uh, and then I started working at the Melbourne Festival uh, when Jonathan Mills was the artistic director there. And, and I was given responsibility 
And I didn't realize at the time how enormous uh, gift that was to be, I was given responsibility to figure out how the festival needed to integrate back into the city and into the fabric of the city and, and to weave kind of surprises that, uh, that uh, perhaps only a festival can bring in that way. And so we had projects in laneways and uh, we, uh, there was an amazing project where we built a rice paddy that was being worked eight or nine hours a day in the central square um, uh, and a whole range of other projects. Uh, and then I went, uh, came, came out of that and decided that I really wanted to leave Australia. Uh, it felt like I could see my trajectory too clearly and I've never really wanted to see, I've always uh, avoided seeing a clear future somehow. Um, so I, uh, and, and I, uh, perhaps on a, not on a whim, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, ill-advisedly took myself to Dublin to interview for a job as the director of the Dublin Fringe Festival. And for better or worse, they gave me the job. I think perhaps because they were just terrified of someone who would fly that far uh, f for a job interview. Um, and so I was in Ireland for three years running the Fringe, which was extraordinary and fun and, and you know, an amazing opportunity for me to discover and explore all that was happening in Europe, uh, in Belgium, in Germany, in Czech, uh, in the Netherlands, in the UK, in France, uh, and so on. Um, uh, and then uh, when Mark Russell left PS122, my predecessor there, the great Mark Russell, who uh you know i'm always conscious that that in these jobs we're standing on the shoulders of giants uh particularly you know particularly in cities like new york where the history and the and and the the body of work on from which we build is is so potent um that and i got the job at ps122 uh and was there for 12 years so i i i won't say that i consciously set out to be a curator or a producer uh, it, it, it happened to me as much as I happened to it. So you didn't study it, you just went from... Okay, I studied you... law. I did a law degree. I studied law. But I mean, I, I, I guess growing up in it was, was studying it. Um, and, um, and I fell in love with it. And I fell in love with, with the kind of contemporary work much more than the, the sort of conventional theatre. And, and uh, you know, I, I fell in love with contemporary dance. Um, one of the, actually, I can really date when I really decided or not, didn't decide, but just realized that there was something amazing that I had missed in, if I just looked at the kind of conventional theater and it was Einstein on the beach in 1992 in Melbourne. Uh, this production came out to Melbourne wow. and Wilson I went to it. Right? I, oh yeah. Uh, uh, and yeah. I don't know if he was. I, well, I, I wasn't I wasn't conscious of it at that point. I was 18. I went to it. My dad said, we're going to this production. It starts at sort of whatever time. I was uh, I said, oh, all right. You know, the reluctance of an eight of a school schoolboy being dragged to a piece of experimental theater. And I said, how long is it? And he said, four hours. And I was like, oh, <laughs> really? You know, can we leave it interval? He said, there is no interval. <laughs> and I said, I went, oh. God, you've got to be kidding. And he said, you can, you can come and go though, if you need to. And I sat there and for four hours didn't twitch and came out of it. And, you know, uh, and it's been extraordinary over the last few years or over the last 15 years, really, to remember that production of, that I saw in 1992 and to see the sort of the its its descendants, whether in the choreography of someone like Sarah Mitchelson or or in, you know in in other kind of contemporary theatre work, to see the 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 different kind of influences of of the artists who worked on that project flow through uh, uh, the work that we still present and support and champion in New York today. Um, and it was incredibly moving uh, a few years back to go back to BAM uh, and see it again. 
Uh, and I remember I was, uh, as it started, I started, I'm getting teary just thinking about it. I started crying and, si and I was singing along, which I think was probably pretty annoying for everybody else in the audience. Mm, yeah, the great Linda Brombach, she brought it back. I was not oh, easy. The amazing, the amazing pomegranate. What a force yeah, of yeah, nature they are. It was amazing. So, um, Vallejo, I'm, I'm sure people also are listening now who are thinking, well, maybe there's something I should do. Could, you know, do you feel that, you know, we, we need we need these producers, these curators? What What is it about? What makes a curator a good curator, an artistic director a good one? What, what, what would you tell them? Do that, but think of this. This is what I think we need. What is it? Especially in the time now. I mean, you should ask someone who's a good curator or a good artistic director, Frank. You shouldn't ask me. Um, but the thing I always thought about, I guess, was where are the gaps? You know, where are the spaces in between? Where are the the places where work isn't ex isn't existing or isn't thriving? And and addressing the 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 opportunity that that creates, I think, you know, trying to be incrementally better than someone else over there, isn't the way to go. It is about finding contexts and situations, spaces, if that's in a literal sense, a space. Um, or, or places that that were that are unfilled and that are where there is uh as you were using that agricultural metaphor earlier where there is fertile ground uh where you can have an impact and where you can make a change where you can make a difference and i think um you know that's that's the i think that the critical thing that we can do is to try and, uh, and and think about it always in terms of the impacts of the work that we do not just in terms of how we how many artists we support or how many nights uh, of shows one of the things that at, when i was at ps that we were really conscious of uh was uh, changing that vocabulary and that emphasis about you know how we landed where what was the impact of doing this what was the way that we thought about what that meant or or, or and who did it impact and that could be could well be the artist but it's not it's not the inputs that we should be measuring it's rather the 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 external consequences um and i think also to consider and to, you know, I guess all of our, one of our challenges in the field, uh, which I think we all have to sort of bend our minds to is, is to try and find new ways of articulating the value of what we do. We're stuck on a treadmill at the moment where our event horizon of the consequences of what we do is far too short. You know, we need to be thinking about consequences of work that we might make or support or champion uh, and, and how that affects someone 20 years later in the way that I'm thinking about seeing Einstein on the beach in, you know, uh, 28 years ago. Um, uh, and, and what is that impact gonna be? And, and, and of course, we don't know. It's a, it's a rule of sort of unforeseen consequences where we can't always say what it's gonna be. And somehow though, we have to find ways of articulating the criticality and the importance of that. Because otherwise what happens is we end up just instrumentalizing the artwork that we support all the time. And, and that's really dangerous as well, because at a certain point, we always lose that argument, <laughs> you know, in, in this field, we always, we're never going to be as important as the hospital or the school or the food bank uh, or the poverty reduction program. And somehow the work that we do has to infiltrate and to use perhaps it's an unfortunate metaphor in, in these times to infect, uh, you know, all of these aspects, but, but without demanding a direct cause and effect relationship between them. Uh, and, but understanding that there is one, but we just don't necessarily know what that effect part will be. And so uh, uh, somehow we have to find ways, a new vocabulary, a new grammar, uh, new ways of, of, of considering 
and uh, delivering on that value um, and on that 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 cause. Um, uh, it's a, I think I'm t I'm turning my words into I'm I'm twisting myself into a pretzel here, but um, it, it's uh, yeah, that's the, I, and 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 I think uh, as a curator, I I think our our uh, what we try and do is place bets on the work and the ideas and and, and the people, the artists who we think will have that impact. Uh, uh, 20 years hence that we don't and, and and not knowing what that impact necessarily will be and and if we think about our work in that way then i think uh you know we we find amazing things even if we uh, even if it takes uh, you know longer than our lifetime to realize mm. yeah no this is a this is a this is a this is inspirational and also real um, um I'm saying, what do you think? I mean, you spoke about Einstein. It was a big production. It toured internationally. Will we see small productions locally now? Is that more what the field will go to? It's interesting. I keep thinking that, as has often been the case, that the independent part of the sector, the independent sector, the smaller venues, the smaller spaces uh, that are more nimble, that are perhaps more agile, that aren't carrying you know, staffs of hundreds of people that they are trying to support, that they will somehow lead the way out of this. I mean, I don't think we know yet, but I hope so. I was, um, I was wandering around uh, downtown, sort of gallery crawling after the galleries that opened uh, a few weeks back and discovered uh, a space, I think it's called Storeroom. I may be getting that wrong. Uh, that is on on the Bowery, just above Canal Street, and it's a new gallery space. Uh, and it, you know, it's, it's a guy in that classic New York way, who has found a basement space that wasn't being used and has started using it, uh, and it was running it as a commercial gallery that's also very much about rearticulating power relationships between the artists and the gallery. And it was so exciting to discover that happening and to discover that re-infiltrating Manhattan because that's something that was, isn't supposed to happen here anymore. Um, and so, yeah, perhaps these smaller spaces, reoccupying places, refinding nooks and crannies uh, that aren't there, I hope, uh, that the it's not just about scale. It's not simply a question of big or small, but it's about it's about finding places where there where there is uh, perhaps untrodden ground, and that's not always easy in New York. Mm. Um, but I think that will be the place that we find it. Uh, I think it's going to take longer than we longer. Tra it's going to take a tragically long time before we're going to be sitting in a theater with seven or 800 people or a thousand people again, uh, uh, laughing and crying and, and uh, uh, watching this, you know, watching something as a collective action like that. Uh, but there are certainly possibilities, both at a small scale, but also uh, uh, in other kinds of space, in other kinds of rooms. Mm. And I think, you know, if there's something that I'm, thinking about as we go through this talk, it's how do we create those alternative, those, how do we reimagine those spaces in which theatre is made, in which that dialogue happens between an audience and an artist, whether those are digital spaces, outdoor spaces, balconies, black boxes. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the challenge of the moment is to reimagine what those spaces look like. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is, uh, this, is, this is true. I remember the great Daniel Gerald, a colleague and friend who died a couple of years ago. He talked about geometamorphosis. He said uh, a geology, geology term that crystals built whatever millions of years ago by pressure, but then two million years later, the crystal kind of decomposed because it wasn't built well enough by nature. And then something else came into that space, you know, because some fluid yeah, yeah. was. So it was in that space filling a form but it was completely different than it was before and um, and i think it's a time of metamorphosis what we what we are in um 
Talking about New York City, um, we had some discussions here, and tomorrow Hillary Miller will talk about the 70s, but New York City was declared drop dead, drop dead, and the amazing art yeah, yeah. came out. The Roaring Twenties, we mentioned that also here, and uh, maybe this is a term, term we can coin, you know, we are in the 20s. The Roaring Twenties were after World War I, after the Spanish flu pandemic, which was devastating, mm -hmm. more dead people than the World War, um, and they came, do you, will there be a Roaring Twenties? Or do you think it will be a very long, painful recovery that will take 10, 12 years, as some, some people say? I mean, <laughs> that's something that we should work for. Isn't that an exciting idea? That this is what we're going to come out. We, you know, it, do we know it when we're in it, though? Or is it just in hindsight? Are we not going to know that we were in in the the uh, roaring twenties or the the whatever it's whatever we're going to call it? But we'll, we probably won't know until we're in the sluggish forties. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, we may not know it. Um, uh, it's uh, look, one can only hope, um, and hopefully this the ideas that are nascent now that are being kind of developed that are sitting at the back of people's minds that are in some cases you know as people are in lockdown that are you know starting to take space um hopefully they will transform things i think it is gonna i i mean there are so many changes afoot in the united states at the moment at a political level at a social level at an economic level that i think uh there's 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 going to be immense territory to cover <laughs> you know i mean we're coming out of this insane moment this insane four years where you know this one figure occupied so much of our brain and talking to people after particularly after the saturday when the election was called and and talking to people who who said to me that they'd slept they'd slept well for the first time in years you know finally they weren't going to wake up terrified of what they were going to read uh, uh, in what the headline was going to be the next morning. Um, and and so thinking about what that means, thinking about the kind of what I hope, what we hope will be, you know, challenges to the kind of economic status quo, to the uh, social and racial uh, status quo that has existed here. Um, and, and hoping that those challenges are substantive and uh, have, you know, some sort of transform transformative ex effect. I suspect that kind of the, the late capitalism that we're in is, is perhaps uh, more pernicious and, and uh, will find ways of uh, uh, staying with us longer than, longer than, than it might. But, um, but nonetheless, I think it's, yeah, it is an exciting time do we end up in a boom? Who knows? Um, who knows? I think, you know, one of the really interesting things to see over the next perhaps two to 10 years is going to be whether or not this shift, not just in terms of office culture, but in artistic culture where so many artists and so many people have left very expensive downtowns, uh, the middles of cities, and, and spread out um, and whether or not that spread, uh, whether it's to upstate New York or to other smaller cities, whether what sort of in, impact that has, whether that kind of uh, means that New York loses its kind of status as being the sort of premier city of generative culture in, in the country, or whether somehow it kind of ends up being a positive feedback loop, you know? Um, I think there's all sorts of things that are going to be really interesting about, uh, and I've been reading a lot of uh, Richard Sennett lately, uh, and he's a wonderful kind of thinker about cities and urban environments and, and creative cultures and, uh, and, and thinking about, you know, how do we sustain the, this concentration? Uh, but, you know, we've been talking for so long in New York about the fact that it's becoming increasingly impossible not just challenging but impossible to sustain oneself here 
that the, the the notion of being a generative artist in this environment was becoming almost uh, yeah almost I- impossible so you know maybe there's something uh, extraordinary as we become comfortable not being in the room with everybody all the time uh, about being somewhere else and coming in maybe it changes the way we work and we relate and maybe other parts of the country rather than just new york start to uh uh participate and engage with and support uh, smaller communities of smaller communities begin supporting communities of artists and uh, uh, activity uh, that could be really exciting for those places and fresh in a way that sometimes you know we get we th- th- that is sometimes in a in a jaundiced New York we take it for granted uh, so finding ways of not taking it for granted again I think is really important yeah, yeah. And that there are empty spaces, as Anne Hamburger, who said she's going to do something in the meatpacking district yeah, yeah. in the Apple stores. A friend of mine says she knows a guy who owns 3,000 apartments in New York City. 40% are empty. And of the 60%, half of them are paying full rent or six. So something really big is going on. There is a reevaluation. Yeah, yeah. It's too expensive. It has been too much. It was crazy. And we all hope that you know this perhaps well there will be some adjustment that the city will be stronger and i believe i love new york city it's a great city and it will come off strong in the long history and we are living through a history of this town uh, the health crisis now oh, yeah. let's say it's the biggest in the history of the united of the united states at the moment what we go through at the moment you know is the biggest thing since world war ii so um it is quite a moment i know you're also studying i, I can't believe it but you also it's at the university now and um so we we are such a leader in the field and we really look up to you we hope you know we talked about a little bit we are trying to think of a 2022 New York International Festival of the Arts in all five boroughs and the parks and parking lots and hosting this institution. We hope, you know, we will get together. Nilo Rao wants to come. Uh, we still have to find a partner for him um, and to put it in. Jay Wagman says, you know, this is great. Susan said, this is a good idea. We'll see. Maybe we can make together a small um, contribution. What are the moments? This Siegel talks, to- Frank. This is, this is just you programming that festival, isn't it? This is what you've done with it. We're preparing it. We are preparing it. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant strategy. It was not the beginning of the idea, but what what do you read at the moment? What inspires you? What do you listen to? Music or poetry? Is this? Do you watch something on it? What inspires you and keeps you going on? We are coming to the end of the conversation now. So, uh, but tell us a bit. What what do you do? I mean, I've been reading, uh, as I said, the Richard Sennett, uh, a, ser- a, a series of books about about cities, about craftsmanship. Uh, uh, I've been, uh, as you said, I've just enrolled in an uh, uh, MBA program at NYU and the LSE and HSE. Um, so I am having to relearn high school algebra again, uh, which is perhaps less inspiring and exciting. Um, and um, uh, at a certain point when I need to uh, escape from it, and, and I always know my, my brain needs a break because what I'll be drawn to is science fiction. So I was rereading, you know, the, the, the Hain series of Ursula K. Le Guin and uh, the most recent William S. Gibson novels, um, which are extraordinary. Um, and, and thinking about, you know, <laughs> the kind of signifiers of those and how to avoid that future. Um, uh, and uh, what else? Uh, and, and of course, uh, it's, I'm finding uh, the news addiction that I developed over the last four years of the constantly refreshing the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Guardian or the BBC's kind of websites and, and more and more understanding that if I'm going to understand a situation, we have to read Fox News, you know, uh, we have to watch it, we have to understand, We, you know, otherwise, we're just in our own echo chamber. And uh, so trying to, uh, I'm finding that habit quite hard to break, I confess. So um, you're watching Fox News, do you watch online performances? <laughs> not nearly enough. <laughs> I told you not to ask me that. <laughs> I find it really hard. I, f- I have to say, I, fi- I-, I found watching shows online incredibly difficult. There have been a couple that are amazing fun. It's, it's funny. There's two different shows I've seen 
which I didn't mean to to watch, but one was the the guys from the Elephant Room, you know, Jeff Sobel and Trey Lifford mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Steve, and they Steve Chiffo, they they uh, they did a show, the Elephant Room in space, or I can't remember exactly what it was called, and it was fantastic. Magic shows are working really well on Zoom. Um, who who would have thought it? But there you are. There's there's adapting this form. Six hundred Highwaymen that piece uh, a thousand ways um which i think is coming to under the radar but is currently happening all over mm. the country in a, in a way it can happen anywhere it's a telephone show there's a brilliant example of people adapting uh and evolving to this moment um uh in ways that are incredible um but i have been a very bad curator in some ways frank in that i have watched very few shows uh online um i found it uh, uh you know helen uh in helen shaw in a talk with you the other day was talking about the challenges to our attention span and i'm finding that that's really true it's very hard to clear space particularly because you know when you've got kids as well i've got one son who's 13 august and and you know he's at home so much more than he was and we're in the same room which is wonderful but at the same time, you're, you know, you're being dragged away. I never was, I never, you know, I confess, I never had the greatest attention span to begin with, but uh, it's, uh, if anything, it's deteriorated a little. Um, but tonight you watched my the dead. You said you watched You Are Nowhere, some online. Uh... Oh, so there's a, there's, yeah, it's interesting. One of the other, we were talking about this, but, you know, we were uh, talking about this fact of being in Zoom all the time and whether or not you should hide self view. Should you see yourself as you're talking? So I've got self view hidden now, but, and uh, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of uh, new spaces popping up that are uh, uh, spatialized chat rooms, I think they're called. So they're often in, sometimes they're sort of like a game layout. Sometimes they're in 3D. And there's one called You Are Nowhere, which is uh, quite interesting where you're a little, you're a shape in this three-dimensional space and you can't see your own face, but you can see lots of other people. Uh, and so I think, you know, all of these platforms are nascent. They're very early and, uh, you know, we haven't moved into the, into the matrix yet where we're, you know, fully immersed in it. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure that we want to go there, but I think, Again, the extraordinary thing about uh, humanity is that we constantly invent uh, uh, and invent our way uh, through these crises and through these problems. And, and, and these crises are opportunities to create new ways forward. Fantastic. Well, that's amazing. So uh, that's, uh, I never heard of it. Uh, you, like you and R, and then uh, Nowhere. That will be interesting. But I really thank you for taking the time and, uh, uh, thank you, and Frank. share us, your, with us your brilliant mind. And we get a little insight, you know, in, in how you think and uh, also what you think of is it of importance. And also to see things as that are happening, things are developing. As you yeah. said, so many things we even do not know about, but just the ones you mentioned and your great, great work um, at the uh, at the UNASIS Foundation. I think it's really inspiring, also showing that it looks like museums, foundations, or universities now taking over some of the development and experimental work that happened in theaters or performance shops, or they collaborate, as you say, let's do it at the chocolate factory. I think these are fantastic hybrid models we kind of forced to, but we said, why didn't we do, do that before? And also, you know, to combine arts and science and economy and ecology. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a lot to discover, a lot to do. And, um, and I think, yes, most probably small spaces will be the ones, you know, that where we have these kind of experiences you had with the Einstein um, on the beach and then other things will come. We, as you've pointed out, we will know only 10 or 20 years from now, really what we are in. But I would also like to remind our listeners, it's the situation we are in is incredible and we shouldn't forget it's, it's a, such a, a complicated time, such a desperate time, such a time of history and we are in the middle of it and we kind of try to look it away and uh, uh, but it is uh, quite amazing so it is a time of change if there ever um, has been one and really thank you for sharing and uh, I thought no, no, thank you for having me it was fun and 
And really, you know, congratulations of all what you have done in your life and in all your work, how many people you have touched and brought together uh, and as artists, as friends, audiences, uh, theater is this arena where people come together and see something from a different way, different light. And this is what we need um, as a public discourse to, you know, replace the, you know, rituals of the church or political dictators. Uh, and uh, yeah, you're right, when Trump lost in Washington Square, it was almost like a dictator in a country uh, left and people were dancing on the streets and streaming and the cars were going around. It's an incredible moment of time and we are in and, and we are part of it, but art has a place there and especially curators, people who run organizations, need vision, need to reach out, need to really rethink and we depend on them. So it's a good reminder that things can be done and that we have to experiment the same what we expect from artists. Tomorrow, as I said, we hear from Hilary Miller who uh, wrote a book on the 70s in New York when it was like drop dead and, uh, and supposedly nothing was going on, but the arts were actually supported by the city and it defined the cities. People stayed because of the arts and great art that went around the world came out of the Bronx and Brooklyn and uh, all the places and um, the Academy of Music came out of it, uh, hip hop and all the street dance and uh, is so much break dance uh, came out of here and we'll see what what might happen so uh, it will be good to hear from her from history and this is not the first time that the city is going through such a such a shake up so thank you again thanks for howlround for hosting us uh, and staying uh, with us and, uh, vj thea and of course andy from the siegel center so valeo again really really thank you then thank you for you know taking this so serious it means the world for us and you know we really think so highly of you um, of your work and we of course will follow closely what what you do and hope also to to collaborate so thank you and bye bye thank you frank thank you